people have been in trouble with the office phone. Greetings and welcome to this webinar on Remembering Past Massacres, Honoring the Legacy and Resilience of Victims. A year ago, Tulsa, Oklahoma was in the global news because of a presidential rally scheduled to take place on the anniversary of one of the most severe incidents of racial violence in US history, the Tulsa Race Massacre. Exactly 100 years ago today, during 18 hours nonstop, the prosperous black neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma was completely burned down by a white mob costing the lives of hundreds of African-Americans living in the area and leaving several thousand of them homeless and displaced. Today, as the centennial commemorations of this tragedy are taking place, we invite you to this webinar during which we will learn about the tragic events in Tulsa and also about other similar tragedies that affect us other communities in the US, Canada, and the Caribbean. This webinar is brought to you by the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs of the WCC. The commission is marking its 75th anniversary this year. Today's webinar will be moderated by Bishop Marianne Svensson. She is the vice moderator of the World Council of Churches Central Committee. She's a bishop of the United Methodist Church. Her co-facilitator will be Reverend Dr. Mikey Roberts. He's a program executive for spiritual life and faith in order at the WCC. He's from Antigua and is an ordained pastor of the Moravian Church. Without further delay, Bishop and Mikey, please guide us in this conversation. Yes, greetings again to all of you who have joined us on this webinar. This is an ongoing effort of our pilgrimage for peace with justice of the World Council of Churches. As we will hear about and consider these past massacres and then how to honor descendants of those who were victims those days, I need to share with you that so many of the stories touch me personally in my own life. My mother was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, just a few miles from Tulsa, and she was four years old when that Tulsa massacre happened. I live in Los Angeles and am very familiar with the Chinese massacre of 1871 here. That was 150 years ago this year. And I was the bishop in Denver for eight years and became so intimate with the Sand Creek massacre there and our efforts to make reparations for the descendants. That was almost 160 years ago now. And the Zong massacre that we've learned about was 240 years ago. So it has been so many years in our past of so much trouble, but there is a different future and we hope to be a part of a different kind of future. The event today is not a lecture, it's more of a conversation, and it's about our remembering and our honoring. It will involve poetry and musical interludes, uh, meditative of sorts. We also wanna finish on a very positive note. We want to honor the work that some of the churches have done in healing the past wounds and in advocating for a just and equitable society. We want to be a part of a different kind of future, one that truly shows God's love for every child and when there is the possibility for abundant life for every child in every place. I'll turn now to our co-facilitator, Dr. Mikey, and have him uh, introduce to you the members of the panel. 
Thank you so much, Bishop Marian, for setting this framework for our discussions today and this conversation that we will be having. And to help us in our conversation, we have pulled together what we believe is a very exciting group of people who are well informed and who will indeed guide us through our discussions today. First, let me introduce to you Russell Burns. And Russell is from the Cree Treaty 6 territory. He currently sits on the National Indigenous Ministries and Justice Council. He is also a member of the Indigenous Caucus of Western Mining Action Network, as well as the Comprehensive Review Task Group. He is from the United Church of Canada, and Russell is also a land-based teacher of Nevia law. Also with us today on our panel is Dr. Daniel Lee. He is the academic dean for the Center of Asian American Theology and Ministry, and also the assistant professor of theology and Asian American ministry at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's an ordained Presbyterian minister, and he has served in a number of ministry contexts, including campus ministry, chaplaincy, immigrant church, Pan-Asian ministry, and multi-ethnic churches. We then come to Mrs. Jennifer Martin, who is the Education in Mission Secretary of the Caribbean and North America Council for Mi Mission, Canacom, and she's also the co-moderator of the Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace for the WCC. Jennifer is a career educator with a lifelong interest in matters surrounding equal opportunities. And her work involves dealing with issues of racism and also seeking to be a multicultural education expert. Then we have with us Dr. Michael McEarren, and Michael is a visiting researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights. He has a PhD in philosophy, and he has held position in universities across the US, Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, Sweden, Germany, and the United Kingdom. His current research focuses on the post-colonial and decolonial perspectives on human rights, structural racial discrimination and reparatory justice. And finally, if you wanna say the homegrown and the person who's on the ground right there in Tulsa, we have with us the Reverend Dr. Robert Turner, who is the pastor of the historic Vernon AME Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he has been, of course, pastoring that church for a number of years and that church is one of the only remaining edifice which survived the 1921 massacre in Greenwood. He is also the academic dean for the Jackson Theological Seminary in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he sits on the National African American Reparations Commissions and the Board of Trustees of the American Village and several other boards. So we are happy that we've been able to pull together a wonderful panel that will guide our conversations and our discussions today. Over to you, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for those introductions of those that will be sharing and part of this conversation today. I'm going to turn now to the very first set of questions. And here now, the first set of questions that we want to ask each of the panelists. Your respective communities have experienced several mass killings and massacres. Can you identify one and briefly share with us the context in which that happened? We will of course start with the tragic events that took place in Tulsa exactly a hundred years ago today. Mikey is gonna read a short poem, I think on Tulsa and then we'll have Dr. Robert Turner, the pastor of the historic Vernon Chapel AME Church in Tulsa, share with us. Can you, okay, good. This is a poem that comes out of the context in Greenwood. I don't remember the terror in Greenwood. I wasn't there. Never was it taught to me in history books. 1921 burning of the Black Wall Street in Tulsa 
by white mobs. I know of racism. I saw the white nationalists march in Charlottesville. White and black freedom fighters joined to counter them. I once read a poem about slavery on the grounds where a white mob fired down a hill outnumbering black men and women is slaughter, whose lives and stories were silence. A rumor of a black man raping a white woman inflamed a weekend, festering fear. Do you not hear the silenced cries? Planes dropping burning balls of turpentine on rooftops. 300 dead and more wounded, 10,000 blacks left homeless. No one told me in school whose lives and stories were silence. Black innocents looked up, shooters aimed down. Their story pursued higher ground. So what do I know but clouds of smoke? Skeletons of charred buildings of greenwood, once filled with restaurants, theaters, businesses thriving, turning to ash, blackening the sky, rising. I read a poem about slavery on the battlefield where the Woody Guthrie Center stands, words and song dampen fear. Memory is firm in the grass of Greenwood. Survivors hold stories in their heart where no mobs may pass. Even though years of lynching and segregation, even when white nationalism marches in Charlottesville, Torches of dead flame in sight flies to hover on flesh. Clans of darkness haunt despair until we stand united. And glory, hallelujah, is the call of the land. What do I know but clouds of smoke? Once rose where memory presses green land. Thank you, thank you so much. Now, Dr. Turner, share with us. You will be involved today, I know, in many events remembering what happened 100 years ago. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, I can hear you. Just a little louder, please. Yes, I just wanted to share that I'm so thankful to be here with you all today um, and so honored to be a part of this conversation. Uh, we're here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are the site of the worst crime investigation in American history. And so we're happy to be here. I'm having some issues uh, right now, but we are we are preparing for the president's visit as well. Walk down there if I can get you. Bishop, I suggest since we are having some connection issues with Dr. Turner that maybe our other speakers can revisit the question that was asked so that we can probably hear from Dr. Daniel and from Russell and and and, and yeah. The other, and we Thanks, can I think, them. yeah, I think that's a very good idea because uh, uh, we were having trouble hearing. So yes, yeah, so let's turn to Dr. Uh, Daniel Lee. And uh, Dr. Lee is actually my neighbor <laughs> at the, the Fuller Theological Seminary, where he is the uh, uh, academic dean for the Center for Asian American Theology and Ministry. So would you share with us uh, uh, your experiences and, uh, and uh, one, you know, where you really want to talk about the context in which it happened? Thank you. Um, so... Uh, of course, there's, there's a number of issues, a number of uh, different massacres that people don't, uh, people are not really familiar with. There's a 1907 Bellingham uh, riots uh, kicked out, you know, where uh, South Asian migrant workers were kicked out of the city up, up in uh, Washington state. There's a Rock Creek massacre where, um, where um, in, in 1807, uh, 70, uh, 1870, where um, workers in San Francisco led a demonstration, and we, they were actually uh, uh, 23 uh, Chinese um, uh, American uh, immigrants were massacred. But I want to focus on the, the infamous Chinese massacre of 1871. And so the context is this: that you know, a couple years before, in 1854, uh, California State uh, passed uh, what the case was: uh, the People versus Hall where uh, 
Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants had no rights, uh, no rights to uh, testify against white immigrants. So whenever violence would happen, when, when, if, if, you know, if the, if the uh, witnesses were only Chinese, then basically they would just go scot-free. And there was an overall sentiment, anti-Chinese sentiment, because at that time, Chinese immigrants were basically the, the largest number of immigrants that were coming to the US at that particular time. Um, so uh, it basically, had, there was a widespread anti-Chinese sentiment. And the idea was the fact that they wanted uh, US basically to be, to be, uh, to be uh, white and not Asian basically. So uh, later on, they passed uh, the law, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the first immigration law in the US and a racist law. So we think about immigration laws and, uh, and kind of race immigration laws is against uh, Hispanics in a sense, but there's a long history of Chinese exclusion. I think fundamentally, one of the things we want, we want to remember the fact that different communities, minorities face ex, uh, racism differently. And the Asian American communities have faced racism in terms of exclusion and erasure. So for about uh, 80 years or so, until uh, 1965 Hart Seller Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, the Asian American population was kept under 1% for about eight years because uh, of what happened uh, in the Chinese Exclusion Act and also after, after that, the Asian Exclusion Act of, of uh, 1924. I think the idea of um, uh, uh, Asian Americans facing racism in terms of exclusion and erasure, uh, that's one of the reasons why so many even Asian Americans don't know about what's happened because there's so much erasure of US history. And that's one of, one of the reasons why we're actually set, uh, we're having this event today to really remember uh, what's happened in the past, to understand the significance of history for the ministry of the church. Um, and, um, and to know the fact that uh, what's happened in the past has echoes in the present as well. When you see what's happening with all the anti-Asian racism, that, 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 you know, what's happening in this particular moment has deep roots, deep, deep roots that go back 150 years. And it keeps on coming back and kind of, uh, uh, kind of showing its ugly head every couple of years. Um, and when we don't know that history, we have no idea what's happening. It's like, what, we, we think this is actually just a, just a contemporary thing or uh, by, uh, by the political uh, vagaries of, of, of uh, uh, what's happening today, but it really has those deep roots and that gives us kind of a deeper understanding of how to adjust these problems and how to address, uh, understand uh, church's witness toward justice and kingdom work. Thank you so much. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing these uh, stories. I, you know, I have uh, living in Los Angeles, I have walked the site of the Chinese massacre uh, in Chinatown and right by Union Station, right in the center and the heart of Los Angeles. And it was so significant to me. But I was a young pastor in Seattle and uh, learned about the Chinese massacre in Seattle. And in fact, I was ordained by our first Chinese American United Methodist Bishop. Uh, in the early 1970s, Bishop Wilbur Choi uh, was our bishop in uh, the Seattle area and was the uh, bishop who ordained me. So the history is uh, so close to my heart and I really, really appreciate your sharing. Um, let's turn now to, uh, to Mr. Uh, Russell Burns, who is our uh, First Nation uh, leader uh, in Canada, who can uh, share with us some of the stories of the First Nation people. Hey, dancing authentic. As I'm gonna kick sip in one sky up again this morning. We woke up. Uh, we're gifted, like many of my uh, little um, uh, innocent child that didn't wake up many years ago. Two thousand mm -hmm. two hundred fifteen of them Kamloops. So for me, it's it's a genocide. It started in fourteen ninety two when we first had this guy, who thought he discovered a land with no people. His name was Columbus, obviously. So, you know, we go back many centuries. We're talking genocide, we're talking uh, massacres. Well, you know, I wanna tell you something on this turtle's back, what we call Turtle Island in North America. At one time, there was well over 70 million of us. And uh, if you look at our population today, not very many of us left, not very many is left. So through these policies of uh, Indian Act, as they, call, as they call us up here in Canada, the Registered Indian Population, RIP, 
<laughs> so, you know, uh, one of those wicked policies was uh, obviously a residential school, right? And you've seen what happens in Kamloops, 215 young kids uh, found in a mass grave. I mean, they, they didn't have the gall to bury each and every one in their own grave. So, you know what, let's dig a hole, let's throw them all in. That's how we're treated today. And that's, you know, for me, I'm speaking on behalf of those old kids who told me, Muslim, you need to become a good ancestor. So I'm, I, I am trying to be a good ancestor. Um, you know, for myself, I'm Treaty 6 territory. I've never lived, I never left Treaty 6. Um, our band, we, we uh, signed on to Treaty 6 in 1876. And many of those treaties were, were, um, were broken once we left the encampment. And uh, obviously the greed was for the resources that we have rich in all of our lands across this great North America. Um, so they segregate us in what they call reservations. You know, they put us away. Let's put these Indians away. We don't need to hear from them anymore. And do you hear from us? No, you don't. You only hear these tragic stories now that are coming out. Um, these little guys are coming here for a reason. They're telling the people the true history of what's happened to us as indigenous folk across this great turtle, this great turtle island. I don't want to take up too much time. I want to get to the questions. Thank you. And Thank you. Thanks so much, Russell. And uh, uh, it is so important. Uh, thanks for reminding us about Turtle Island. <laughs> uh, you know, the I had only just learned that heard this past week uh, about the, the children and, and what had happened uh, uh, through those residential schools. And it's just breaking my heart uh, hearing about that. And uh, I know I have a friend in Alaska who talked about his life uh, going to a, living in a residential school and what that was like and helping me to learn some of those stories. It's just so incredible. And as I've talked before, uh, the Sand Creek massacre was just so, painful for me to learn about. When my first year in Denver, the students at the School of Theology refused to have their graduation at the church where the man who had caused that uh, massacre had gone to that church. And I was grateful for their witness. It was a strong witness for them to make at that time. But we'll hear so much more. And, and as you said, participate in the questions and the answers. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let's turn now to Jennifer Martin from uh, the Caribbean and uh, the stories that she can share out of her context. Jennifer, share with us, please. I'm very happy to be part of this gathering. And in fact, we are meeting at such an important time when, when more and more horrors are being unearthed. And important because we need to consider the whole experience of the human family together. And so this is an, an opportune time. The word, of mass, uh, the word massacre brings to my mind and indeed to the minds of many persons in the Caribbean an ongoing situation of injustice which started centuries ago and continues into the present in, in different forms. With particular reference to the slave trade, the trade which brought formerly freed African people to the Caribbean to be enslaved on these shores continues to have resonance today. When we consider that people were taken from their homes, marched over large distances, sold off like animals, and brought on overcrowded ships. The idea of, of, of massacre comes to mind very, very clearly in terms of the actual travel to the Caribbean, particularly the era called the Middle Passage where Many persons simply did not survive. This, this kind of gathering doesn't give the opportunity much for picture sharing, but I'm sure many of you have seen drawings, etchings of, of slave ships that had people packed like sardines. And so many, many did not survive. As, as time progresses this morning, I'll talk a little bit, but I'll raise the name now of the, the, the Zong massacre in particular. There, there are other stories that can be spoken of. But in, in that one particular story, which took place in 1781, 400, some 400 African persons were being brought to the Caribbean. And along the way, it was decided that some of them were not worthy of the journey. Some fell ill and died. But 132 who were very much alive were thrown overboard. 
and and oh and out of that horror the the abolition of slavery was was speeded up somewhat when we recognize that for a very long time african persons were not seen as 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 full humans we can make the comparison with what happened to some of our sisters and brothers on turtle island who were themselves described as being one third human. And so taking it back to the Caribbean, those who safely made the journey came to this island and their, their, their lives, their bodies did not belong to them. So their, their literal lives could be taken from them without, without any court of law being ready or required to stand in their defense. And so the, the, the population of parts of West Africa today have still suffered from that heavy movement of people. And in, in, a, in a cruel turn of irony, the, the people, the black persons who have survived in the Caribbean islands today and who make the vast majority are still suffering from the results of the carnage and massacre, which formed part of their, their early experience. In the region today, violence, is very much a part of the life experience. And part of that violence has, has plagued us throughout. And so what, what, what began as, as willful massacre to a certain extent has a, a different kind of permutation now where, where, where the, the, the loss of, of black life in the region is, is of great concern. I wonder if I might stop there for now. Yes, thank you. Thank you so very much. And what a powerful reminder of the beginning and the history there. Uh, so very much. The stories just multiply uh, when we begin to hear them. Well, now then, that's an appropriate time for us to turn again back to Dr. Robert Turner in Tulsa, where uh, he can remind us of the story uh, of the massacre that did happen there in Tulsa 100 years ago. Dr. Turner, speak to us now and be sure to unmute yourself so we can hear you. And it would appear, Bishop, that of all the days when we need to hear from Dr. Turner, we are having yes, connection so issues. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the virtual space. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, while we, while we do so, since this is a conversation and an ongoing one, um, Jennifer just spoke about a massacre that's called the Zung Massacre in 1781. And as we keep this conversation going, permit me to share with you another poem um, called Men of Their Time. And this was written by Lloyd Gale Ward and this is a poem about the Zong massacre. They say they were men of their time, but what does that even mean? Is it seeking to explain away the treatment of others? Does it make them feel better? Why do we seldom allow ourselves to feel how others felt or feel? Is it so not to glimpse at the pain and suffering of others? Will acknowledging it slow down progress and development? Where are we going anyway? Would apologising mean it wouldn't happen again? Is that why apologies are not forthcoming? Imagine, you've been taken from your family, your friends, the life you know, being transported to who knows where, shackled to people who look like you, but who you do not know. Your child holds you tight. There are angry, different looking men speaking in an angry, different tongue. Hello? They begin yeah, to grab people and take them up towards the fresh air and light. The same fresh air and light you have not seen for days now. With your eyes you're taking more water than you could ever imagine. You're in awe of its beauty, your pain and trouble slip away. The warm gentle rays of the sun caresses your skin and you feel human again. You close your eyes. The fresh air enters you and gives you reason to want to take another breath. For a flickering moment, your mind is transported to a place of near bliss. Dare you smile? Then the horrendous screams begin. 
Women and children are being thrown overboard. They say they were men of their time, but what kind of men are these? The warm salt water splashed against black and brown bodies, cleansing them from the filth they've been forced to endure. You scream like you've never screamed before, like you never knew you could. You beg to be taken back to the dark, stinky, filthy place on board the ship. They say they were men of their time, but what kind of men are these? Your child looks you in the eyes, their eyes asking you what is happening. Why are angry different men speaking in an angry different tongue treating us like this? You have no words to console them, but while you think of what to say you stop screaming. You hold your child tighter, hoping the love and strength of your brace takes them from this hell into peace. More and more women and children are thrown into the water. You realise that screaming is of no use. These different angry men with different angry tongues can hear you but do not care. For they are just men of their time. Black and brown bodies are disappearing beneath the waves before your eyes. You attempt but fail to console your infant and realise this is it. Your time is up. You take your last breath of warm fresh air as you both descend into the abyss. Finally the screams end. Your last thought is not of your family, your friends, the life you once knew or the child you still hold so tightly, but that of the angry men who threw you and your child into the Atlantic were just men of their time, so it's okay. They say we should not judge people by today's standards and they were just men of their time, but what kind of time was that? What about the other men of their time who opposed how they were treating others? Is it time that is at fault or the decisions of man? With the decisions, actions or inactions we take today, are we in danger of becoming men and women of our time? Thank you. Thank you for this meditative moment. And I do think that we have uh, Dr. Turner uh, able to be seen and heard at this time. So Dr. Yes. Turner, please do speak to us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thankful to be in your midst. We are here at Ground Zero, um, the worst site of American history for racial terror, the largest uninvestigated crime scene in this country, um, where for 16 hours um, from May 31st at 10.31 p.m. Central Standard Time to June the 1st, um, the first time in American history bombs were dropped on American soil. Um, people were killed, looted, and bodies dumped in mass graves. And to this day, not one person has been charged with the crime. Um, we lost churches. We lost businesses, over 600 businesses, over 20 plus churches, houses of worship, schools, libraries, theaters, um, and over 1,256 homes all went up into flames in this so-called land of the free and home of the brave. I am immensely disappointed in this democracy that allowed the massacre to happen, and I'm even more frustrated with this country, whereas you see a hundred years later, as we commemorate the centennial of the race massacre, nothing has been done. No reparations, no restitution, no investigation, no criminal charges, nothing has been done. In fact, even after the massacre, when we rebuilt the city, the state and the federal government chose to put an interstate highway through the heart of our community, and with no off ramp. And then they came back and they purchased the houses in our community. This is a gross miscarriage of justice. If we truly are members of the United Nations, what happened here was a violation of the Geneva Convention where bombs were dropped on innocent people, churches and homes, children and grandmothers. If we truly 
have rule of law, then why has there not been an investigation? We condemn foreign nations for having mass graves. We condemn foreign nations for attempts at genocide and massacres that are state sanctioned because everything that happened here was sanctioned by the city. The, the people who looted, bombed, and killed were deputized by our city police department and nobody went to jail. So if we can condemn, if we can put embargoes on other nations until they do right by their citizens, if we can condemn foreign leaders and dictators for inhumane treatment to their citizens, then who will condemn America for the gross miscarriage of justice when she has committed massacres, state sanctioned, dropping bombs on her own citizens? So I, every week, go out to City Hall, and I go and I protest in a Bible study to call the city to recognize the horror of what she did, to also call the city to repent of what she did, and to call this city to repair for the damage of what she did. Since nobody else is willing, it's, it's incumbent upon the faith community, you know, who does not answer to a mayor, who does not answer to a governor, who does not answer to a president, but I answer to God. And I'm amenable to his word. And his word tells us in Isaiah 61 that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, the folk who've been mistreated, to bind up the broken heart, the folks who had their hearts crushed and to set at liberty the captives, even people who are in bondage and captivity to white supremacy. And I read that text every Wednesday at City Hall. Thank you all so much for having me here. Blessings. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you for this witness and for your ongoing witness and for your willingness to be a part of our conversation today. This is a very appropriate moment for us to pause and uh, be reflective and listen to Amazing Grace. This is one of the songs that is probably most well known across the face of the earth. It is a song that, interestingly enough, can be played on all of the black keys of the piano. <laughs> and history records that it is a tune that more than likely came from the groans and the moans of the slaves, the Africans who had been enslaved as they made their way across the Middle Passage. And as we have heard about the men of their times and the incidents that have occurred, not only in Tulsa, but everywhere, and the various stories, I also want us, having heard the Amazing Grace melody, to use this also as a moment to remember all of the lives lost. These are not just numbers. They were someone's daughter. They were mothers, fathers. They were human. And this tragedy that was done to them indeed is a reflection of the ways in which we all inflict suffering one to the other as human beings. And so as we pause even now, might we remember them? And not only remember them, might we also give God thanks for the resilience of the ancestors who made it, 
and who today still say to the world, we are still here. In spite of all of that, we are still here. And so this latter part of our discussion now, which Bishop will lead us, we will now look at how we can move forward in some way, not only remembering, but also trying to see how we can make sure that this legacy is never forgotten. Bishop, back to you. Thank you, thank you. And yes, uh, let's uh, turn to our expert, to uh, Dr. Michael McEachran and ask, you know, wouldn't these tragic events today qualify as crimes against humanity and even genocide for some of them, just as Dr. Turner referred to them that way? Is there some work towards recognition? And can you give us some examples of how we might recognize and begin reparation and make a difference? Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. I'm um, very glad to, to be on this call with, with everyone and, and to be uh, listening to the moving testimonies um, so far. Uh, to your question, um, we wouldn't want to get too uh, technical about the concept, the legal concept of crimes against humanity, we can recognize that all these atrocities that were committed should be conceptualized as crimes against humanity, at least in the sense that they were terrible atrocities and, and crimes, most of them most definitely should be and would be categorized as crimes against humanity. Now, I think we are seeing some extraordinary developments and today's um, webinar, this webinar is an example of, of of something that is on the move, very much on the move, and that is increasing calls for reparations, for restorative justice, for reparatory justice, for as a spokesperson of the Nama people, Sima uh, Lupert uh, put it in expressing her misgivings about the the uh, recent German reparations to the Herero and Nama people of Namibia saying that it is not up to us to decide if that apology is genuine or not. This is not about money. It is about the restoration of, of human dignity. And this is in fact what reparations at its core is about, it is about restoring human dignity, rectifying the injustices of the past and their impacts on the present. And with this in mind, it is, I believe, very important. And this is something that is is increasingly well recognized, has been recognized by the Special Rapporteur on Racism, Tendaji Achuma, and her report on reparations and racial justice to the General Assembly in 2019. It's uh, recognized by the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent and many others. And that is that what needs to be healed what needs to be rectified are the systems that continue to perpetuate injustices against, for instance, people of African descent in the Caribbean that are continuations of past uh, injustices. And so very aptly, the Caribbean community of 15 member states, CARICOM, are calling on European states to rectify the 
consequences of past injustices by adopting a 10 point plan for reparatory justice, which includes such things as debt cancellation and addressing the rampant health issues that I think Reverend um, or Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Martin, Martin was, was referring uh, to. And so there's a lot of movement today and uh, this webinar is an example of, of, of this, this movement towards reparatory justice and a restoration of human dignity, equality, and, and non-discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us the whole global perspective and, uh, and help us to turn towards uh, what to do now and how to, how to make sense and to move forward. Uh, Dr. Roberts, I think, has a question that has come in on our, uh, on our question and answer uh, thing. So let's hear the question and then we'll turn to uh, our panelists again uh, with the, uh, the other questions we want to ask them. Yes, Bishop, thank you. A question that came in while we were uh, on engage earlier was actually directed directly to Dr. Turner. So I hope he can hear and answer us uh, before we lose him again. Um, this person asks, as I read the history of the Black Wall Streets um, being your greatest, I said he also learned that he resigned from the Centennial Commission. And he this question asks for Dr. Turner, what has been his greatest disappointment in terms of the local effort? Uh, that's very good. Uh, yes, let's, uh, let's let uh, Dr. Turner reply to that. And then I'll ask uh, some of the other questions that we'll all follow up with as well. Dr. Turner, did, did you hear the question? We may not have him. We may Is not he have there? Him. <laughs> All right, we'll hold it and see if we can uh, get a hold of him uh, to reply. Sure. Uh, and and while we do, let me uh, let me raise these questions and uh, have our other panelists reply to them. Uh, really, how do we honor the fallen heroes uh, of the past tragedies, and how do we celebrate? the survival and the resistance and the resilience of the communities and how do we honor their martyrdom? Uh, and what can prevent us from falling into amnesia or denial? Uh, how do we memorialize the tragedies? Uh, are these uh, monuments sufficient? How do we transcend the past massacres and move towards a healing? What about rep reparations for descendants? And how do we ensure that the future generations will learn from the past and that history will not be repeated? Uh, let's ask Dr. Daniel Lee if you would reply first. Uh, yes, I mean, I think one of the most fundamental things is just the fact that uh, uh, Christians uh, see the importance, believe the importance of history. I think there's, I mean, as, there's a sense sometimes uh, where you ha can have a very individualistic faith where we say it doesn't really matter uh, what happens in the past or even in the communities because this is actually my reality at this particular moment. So that's one of the most important things. How do we understand the fact that our God is a God of the covenant, God of history, the God, and, and that historical con uh, connection matters. And then to really uh, uh, recover history, so much of our history has been raised and so sometimes we have to go find it. We have to dig it up and we have to kind of continually teach our communities what the, what the history is. Um, and then when we, when we learn the history, um, how do we make sure that we tell uh, the fuller history, the, the, the broader history? Sometimes I think uh, historian, uh, Lutheran historian Robert Erickson talks about the fact that during Nazi Germany, people like to tell the true the history of true Christian witness, ignoring the fact that majority of Christians supported uh, Nazis and supported Hitler. So this is where sometimes we kind of tell a, a, a sanitized version of what we, what we think is, is the church history without realizing the fact that history itself shows that church has been so complicit in so many ways. So 
realizing how, how important history is to recover it, recovering it, and also to telling the fuller history of what, the, what really happened and actually church's uh, complicit role, I think is so crucial. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hadn't thought about that, but it's really true. We, we need to recover history in order to uh, make it different for the future. Uh, that, really does, uh, that really does help. Uh, Russell Burns, would you share with us now uh, your thoughts on these things? I could spend many days on a lot of these things, but uh, <laughs> I wanna go back to uh, this, this question uh, too. Would, uh, these tragic events amount to crimes against humanity. Well, you got to remember that uh, at one time, this was just a big rock, rock and water. So we coexisted. We're supposed to be coexisting with what we call Wakota and our relations. And we say that, that's with this rock behind me, with all the minerals, with all the plants, that's coexisting. And as humans, obviously, they've changed that whole perspective of control, right? And so this is what happens. Uh, you know, we look at this word genocide. Um, you know, it's a deliberate killing of large number of people uh, for particular nations. My friend there talked about Germany. I mean, you look at Hitler. He bought, he, he uh, sent over some of his generals just to see how it was working in the U.S. With the, with the segregation of indigenous folk. It was working. And then, you know, what he did later on, right? Which wasn't good. Um, you know, this is uh, um, easy for me, easy, because I've lived this history, I'm still living it, and what we have in many nations, we're resilient, we're still here. And, uh, you know, our people have fought for generations for just a piece of land that was, um, was uh, put there for, well, I shouldn't say put there for us, this is where the uh, United States, uh, um, United States, uh, um, government put a lot of people in reservations. There's, there's a line, what we call the medicine line. North is Canada and south are the U.S., our brothers and sisters. In Canada, we have reserves. In the USA, they have reservations. So you look <laughs> at all these little pieces of land across this great, it, it, they look like islands. They look like islands. And many of that land that's offered is stolen land. So we're talking about reparation. What would you think? What would what would I say? Give us our land back. You know that's sovereignty, um, but it's not going to happen. Obviously, um, you know we still need to work hard against it. Um, I got so much to say, so much to share, but that's all I want to say for now. I need to give my other people some great opportunities to speak on this. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Russell. Thank you so much. Uh, I, you know, my childhood was filled with the stories of the Trail of Tears and the people that had to move all from their from their land all across to what became what was the Oklahoma Territory in those days, and uh, and the horror and the loss and the the loss of of lands and living on the land is just so. Uh, so powerful. Uh, someone has asked in the questions if you would say something about the ribbons on your shirt. Oh, okay. So <laughs> if you can see them all, these are this is what we call ribbon shirts. And in many of our communities, many of our ceremonies, we, we wear ribbon shirts for prayer. And for mine, um, we had a, a the first elders conference in Canada in Edmonton, Alberta, which is just an hour and a half uh, north of me, north from me. And uh, many of us, we thought we need to hear their wisdom and knowledge. And uh, because all of a sudden now COVID happened. And you know what? We've lost many of our knowledge keepers of our languages. We've lost many knowledge keepers of our ceremonies. We've met, lost many knowledge keepers of our stories. So we've lost many important people in our lives. And this is the, one of the reasons why I wear these ribbon shirts to acknowledge them but when i was there uh an elder called me and he said russell come here so i went over and you know um part of our healing is humor we love to laugh we love laughing and obviously and we love eating <laughs> so that's part of the ceremonies we have like when we gather we eat we laugh we just love each other 
So he said, Russell, uh, I want to tell you my story of the ribbon shirt. And he goes, the reason why we're all these ribbons, he had many ribbons on his shirt like this. He said, it's because of the Sand Creek Massacre. And he said, eight hours that changed history. People almost forgot about it. You know, there was, can you imagine that, um, um, you know, well over 800 people were, were, were killed. Many of them were elders and children, and many were, were our women. He said uh, there was a thousand of them that, uh, that, you know, just came from a fort, you know, talking about peace, coexisting, you know, hey, we're going to, we'll, we'll move to reservation and, you know, we'll let you guys farm here. It didn't happen that way. Um, they sent uh, 675 cavalrymen. This, this was the army, all right, hunting down the really tough guys. And out of this, eight of these cavalrymen got, got honorary uh, badges for what they did. But the, when the brave, when the, when the hunters that could ride, they came back with the food. They came back, their village was on fire. And many of the women were still running out of the bush and, or you know, just helping one another. And many of the elders were dresses back in that day. They were dresses. And when they came over, the wind blew through the village. And, and uh, you know, what, what the soldiers used were not the guns anymore. They were using the, head, uh, the, uh, the, the rifles that, that, that they had just to crush the skulls. And also their swords. Remember, they had the sabers. So what happened is they went around and, you know, all these old women running around, you know, so and they were cutting Cutting, cutting the dresses. So when these soldiers came over, they said all they could see were the old women and the wind carrying, carrying their, uh, their, their, their ribbons in, in the air. So that's why I wear these in memory of those women, of, of our children that we lost. Also now, I wear them. I'll be adding more ribbons on behalf of the children that we lost, 215 in that mass grave in Kamloops. So what happens there, as many of those kids could have been great, great grandmothers, great, great grandfathers. We lost so much knowledge to this genocide. So that's why I wore a ribbon shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. And I can share that. I know that uh, from the Sand Creek Massacre, the descendants still have a run every year. The dis, uh, around Thanksgiving, they have a run. And so they remember the story of the Sand Creek Massacre and they're working really, really hard uh, to make reparations now. Uh, and uh, it's not enough, but it is a beginning uh, towards a different, uh, a different kind of future. Um, I'm going to turn to Jennifer for her thoughts on these questions. But before I do, let me just share something I learned one time when I was visiting in Cuba. And they in Cuba, they were telling me that um, when they were about to have the killing of the last chief of the indigenous community of Cuba years and years ago, someone said to the chief, before we kill you, do you want to become a Christian? And of course, <laughs> he said, you're going to kill me anyway. Why would I want to do that? Uh, and, uh, and I think about the loss of indigenous people in so many places and, uh, and all over the Caribbean with the history and the horrors of the things that happened there. So Jennifer, what can you share with us as, uh, as you reflect on these other questions? Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you, Marian. That's a good story you just gave. Um, Bartholomew de las Casas wrote that in trying to convert some Indians, they asked whether in heaven there were people like the Spaniards. The Spaniards said yes. Well, those particular carriages said, then we do not want to go to your heaven based upon what they have seen. So, so there, there's always that, that, that story underlying everything else. Um, I had started at, at 1781 with the Zong massacre, and I, I raise it again briefly, because that massacre was undertaken because the persons doing it expected no reprisal. They did not, all that they expected actually was that they would have been compensated for the loss of stock because we know that the slavers were very heavily insured. Well, as it happened, the claim was put in and in Jamaica, the authorities found it was not a good claim. And, but no, that the authorities granted, granted uh, the claim, but then the courts in England overturned it saying that nobody had proved 
that the killings were not illegal, that the killings could not have been prevented. And so that was a very important landmark decision. I mentioned that year, and I, I come quickly now to 240 years, which is where we are. And I mentioned St. Elizabeth, which is where that particular slave ship was, was, was headed. Now, if you were to visit St. Elizabeth today, a very beautiful parish, the waters are just so wonderful and, and mostly tranquil and a great tourist attraction and so on. You would never imagine the horror associated with that place. I think it is very, very important for us to continue to remember these things. And, and in, the, in the Caribbean islands, there are forms of remembering, such as emancipation speeches and festivals marking independence and so on. But there is much more that is needed to be done. And so as Mikey and, and others have mentioned, there is a strong movement for reparations in this part of the world. CARICOM, churches, and, and various bodies. In Jamaica, for example, there is a national reparations movement. Where have we got with reparation? Much and much work is being done, but in terms of funds beginning to be paid out so that educational institutions, for example, could be built, we are still on the road to, to discussion. But, but much work has been done by many scholars, including Professor Shepard and many others over Quite, quite a few years. Um, churches are more and more aligning themselves with, with the reparation movement. And um, the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands is one such, the Baptist Church is one such, the Moravians are in on the discussions as well. And so church people are, are very, very interested. But um, there, is, there is one, apart from what we call reparation and we expect success to come of that, there is one big thing staring at the whole world that is very, very achievable, and it is called economic justice. Because were we able to obtain economic justice in the world marketplace, in, in the trading of goods and, and, and in the terms of reference and so on that take place, then we would not, for example, have so many refugees trying to leave parts of the world that are oppressed economically. So that is one big thing that can be done. The region obviously is aware of its racial and its racialized history, and some of that history is, re is remembered. But there is, there, there, when we think of this particular Zong massacre, not many people know about it. Some people know about it, but not many, not, not enough people know about it. So I asked in, in, in thinking about speaking at this presentation, I asked quite a few persons who had never heard about it, but, there are others who know about it, and there and, and there is there is a monument in Black River celebrating, commemorating, calling us to remember this incident and really never to forget it. Because if if in 2021 we fall into ease and comfort and forget the horrors of the water, forget the ship that came to the Black River with the remaining Africans who were not killed on board, then we allow ourselves to fall into amnesia. And we really ought, ought not to do that. And so to summarize then, we are working towards reparation and we, we expect in this part of the world through the Council for World Mission to receive an apology for, for the CWM's part in, in, in slavery. And we expect some reparation through that source. So it is reparation and remembering and keeping our personal and collective commitment to not through our actions or inactions, allow incidents of that nature to occur in the future or indeed in the present. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us that in fact, some of the churches are truly beginning to identify with the reparations movement and make a difference. That's so very, very important. Uh, I was so gratified here in Los Angeles to see our um, city government 
return land on the beach in Manhattan Beach to the descendants of those from whom their land had been taken away from them. And that was a remarkable uh, beginning of reparation. But of course, there was reaction to that as well for people that didn't want that to happen. So the struggles uh, continue. Uh, we have a really, really good question from Catherine Laurie. But before we get to her question, I, I want to turn again to our uh, our expert and uh, ask him uh, what he can say on uh, reparations, particularly in international human rights law. And are there any successful instances in other contexts globally, like debt cancellation as a form of reparation? What can you share with us about that? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Um, yes. So let me um, start by going back to what um, Reverend Dr. Robert Turner said about Tulsa and today's 100th anniversary of, of, of Tulsa, which he called the largest unexamined crime scene in the US. And he reiterated over and over again that, that nothing has been done. Um, and that this is an affront even to the, the rule of law. And he's, of course, very correct in all this. And um, however, one can extend this to the US as such and say that the entire United States, as I believe Russell Burns and Daniel Lee and uh, others on this call would, would agree with the entire United States is a crime scene, an unexamined crime scene. It is based, founded on crimes, on genocides, on at atrocities, crimes against humanity that have been that were not only grave injustices, but that were never properly examined, nef never properly accounted for, and never ever addressed and rectified in terms of justice. So, and that in itself is a severe, profound injustice. And so the US has a lot of reparations to do. The entire Caribbean is also a crime scene. And European states have never recognized it as such, has never done anything to address it as such, to rectify the injustices of the past and perhaps most importantly, their profound impacts on the present. And so reparations does not only or not first and foremost, although this is an important part, um, include remembrance and remembering the past. This is a critical part, part but more critically and fundamentally, it needs to involve a transformation of the present injustices that are a continuation and a perpetuation of past injustices. Now, international law does support this concept and this sort of view of, of, of reparations. And as I said before, this is increasingly recognized at the UN level I think it's fair to say that it is recognized by the high commissioner even of human rights who has gone out in support of, of reparations. And I think of a concept of reparations that is in line with what I just said. It is also supported by the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism. It was supported by several speakers at a groundbreaking uh, webinar, I think it was last week, by the American uh, Society of International Law. 
So from a legal, international legal perspective, law perspective, this is a, an understanding of, of reparations that has a lot of traction today and where there's a lot of movement building also from civil society uh, around this sort of view on of reparations, which I think also it's even fair to say that indirectly anyway, the Secretary General of the United Nations expressed a similar view of the need for the international community to, to address the lasting consequences of various sorts of colonial injustices that are continuing to reverberate in the present, including in the many of the global economic injustices uh, as uh, Mrs. Martin uh, referred to. So yes, I think I'll end there, thank you. Excellent, thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, this is a time now, we have a few minutes for uh, some conversation among ourselves uh, on the panel and the questions that have come to us in the chat room. Uh, Dr. Daniel Lee, I think you had something you wanted to share. And then I'll ask Dr. Roberts if you would share the question from Catherine Laurie and maybe some others that you have there from the chat and, uh, and just have replies that people want to make. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to just make a comment in that, you know, uh, so during World War II, uh, uh, basically, U.S. government basically incarcerated uh, 120,000 uh, Japanese American citizens. I mean, Japanese Americans. Um, about about uh, two thirds of them were American citizens, and two, one third of them couldn't become citizens because U.S. didn't allow uh, Japanese uh, immigrants to become citizens. But basically, what I want to point out was that uh, later on, all these little concentration camps, which is basically what FDR called them, uh, were going to disappear altogether, and actually. Japanese American activists fought tirelessly to actually have these incarceration camps be restored and be kept as historical sites and also to actually get their reparations. So this is actually a case in the US where Japanese Americans were able to get reparations. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge amount of money, but in 1988, they were able to get $20,000. Of course, the amount was significantly more because uh, basically all the people who basically were put in these camps lost everything. But that's a, it's a situation where U.S. was able to kind of uh, have a reparation um, happen for a particular oppressed people, and that's that can serve as a model and, say, and and just kind of, or at least as a monument to say, well, look, how why can't something like this happen for other communities in the U.S. as well? So I think that it's important to remember the history, the fact that reparations has been ha, has been done, and actually, and U.S. government has recognized such reparations. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to point that out. Mm, thank you. Yes, I, re I remember one story of just of a friend who lived in uh, his friend's home while the friend was taken to the camps so that he could save the home so that when the friend came out of the camps, he would have his home to return to. That's nothing like the kind of reparation that needs to be done by the government, but it was a thing, a kind of human thing uh, that someone could do. All right, let's hear what questions have come in the chat that you could ask for the panelists to comment on. Uh, there is a question that I would like to ask as we continue this conversation. Although we are speaking of reparations and that does have its place and it certainly is worth pursuing, whether it is through debt cancellation or return of funds or investment, um, how do we see apology? Um, what, what is the value of an apology? And I guess maybe that is how I would put the question. Does it, does it mean anything? Um, or would you be in a place to say, um, we need more than an apology? Recognizing that for some, whether governments or even for that matter, the church, even apologizing is, is a problem, a problematic. So what is the value of an apology? Uh, I, would, I would offer a brief, a brief comment. And I, I approach it um, this way. Um, when I used to be a school teacher a long time ago, I never demanded apologies from rude children. I always felt that if a child felt sufficient, sufficiently convicted in her spirit or his spirit, 
that child would come and say something. That, that was the way I operated. However, if I were advocating for one of my staff members, I would request that the child, what do you think you should do? And hopefully the child would go. I, I do believe in the value of apology, especially if it, if it is voluntary, and especially if it has come after 300 years of thinking and talking about it. Now, an apology on its own, I do not think is valuable enough because of the suffering that the, the, the hero and the hero's generations before would have gone through. So an apology that is accompanied by monetary reward, even if not for the individual, but for the group of people. So for example, I've heard of some cases, I think in Liverpool is one example where an apology has been given and some money has been paid into a particular university so that descendants of that community can achieve their university education then yes, I would support it. Apology followed by something concrete and good and beneficial. And, and a pledge not to revert to the, the particularly colonial activity which, which would have brought the situation around in the first place. Return of human dignity tied into all of that. Hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, you know, we heard about the need to, for transformation of the present injustices. And someone asked, what are some of the most dire massacres today, the things that are happening right now that need our attention and our activism. Russell, can I, yes, go yes, ahead. Yes, Russell, go ahead, Russell. Yes. Um, well, back to the apology, right? Uh, you know, we've had so many apologies given to us from the United Church of Canada, which we haven't accepted yet. We, we don't oh, accept yeah. those apologies because they're just, you know, words aren't strong enough. And we just had an apology from uh, mm -hmm. Harper, as you know, to our Canadian. You know what? My, mm -hmm. my beautiful wife was graduating from the U of A with her second diploma. And education mm. is very important in many of our communities. I sat in that instead of watching Harper do his apology. And, uh, you know, moving forward um, uh, with the apology, like, you know, we've had apologies from premiers, we've had apologies from churches, we've had apologies from civil society, none, none have been solid. So, you know, um, and moving forward with the, uh, with, with, with the, uh, with the new massacres and new talks. See, I wanna read you something from uh, Nelson Mandela, all right? Uh, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his mother's language, that goes to his heart. Mm. That was Nel that's what Nelson Mandela said. Mm. So and this is what this apologies did the try to apologize for myself going to residential? They took away my that 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 native tongue, right? And, and uh, you know, at one time on this great nation of ours, we had 500 nations, we had 500 languages. I mean, it was amazing. We had different dialects, and language is my identity. It's who I am. Uh, in our story, our woman's story, we say Tante Ochekia and Otsi. In my language, is belly button. So what I'm asking you is, where's your belly button from? And that's identity, that's our creation story, all right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's an entity, it's our love, it's our life. And uh, I just wanna share that. And, uh, you know, um, further going, and, and, and I ask each and every one of you panelists, and I ask each and everyone on the screen, go to an elder. <laughs> Do you know? Do your protocol. Ask about our history. I mean, it's you know, we've been here for a long time, and and many of the stories are about resilience. And uh, you know, I don't I don't speak on my. I only speak for myself. I've got so many people, so many ancestors, like the ones behind me that have my back. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are getting close to the time now, where we're about to draw to a close. Uh, I'll turn to Dr. Roberts for uh, our co-facilitator for comments and a final co conversation you want to have. And then I'll have some final comments as well. And, uh, and then we will close. Thank you so much, Bishop. I am actually 
dying to hear some response to your previous question in terms of uh, <laughs> massacres, events happening today that we need to give our attention to. So rather than um, me occupying much of the time, I don't know if um, our panelists can simply say in a few seconds or two uh, to us who are all listening and watching today, here's what we need to pay attention to. So I'll, I'll begin with Dr. Daniel and, and, and then Jennifer and, and, and Michael and Russell, just quickly. Okay. Very good. Uh, I, what I would say is that um, uh, realize the fact that even the community themselves, at least for the Asian American community, they might not know their own history because they're educated in the U.S. system and U.S. education system erases Asian American history. And so in that sense, we've been kind of harnessed in our minds about our own history. So we need to recognize it as well, not the fact that the community themselves not, might not necessarily know their own history. And how do we kind of collectively uh, affirm the importance of this history uh, of various groups. That's basically what I would say. Thank Thanks. you. Jennifer or Russell? Yes, yeah, yes. Um, I, I sit here quietly and I'm, I'm thinking of, of our friend and colleague, Reverend Dr. Osborne James, Osbert James in Grenada, who along with others have spent a long time cha championing the cause of economic justice for the region through Jubilee and so on. And I mentioned that because if, if we if we are speaking of we are see, speaking about massacres, but the, the wave of crime in the Caribbean is, is intimately tied up with the economic situation with which we grapple. And the church is off to the one side raising its banner too. So if, if we can collectively challenge the, the world economic system and to say that poor economic decisions in other places are literally causing death in this part of the world in terms of healthcare, street crime, lack of education, some people risking their lives to go to sea to escape. So if we can if we can untie that knot, then some of what we, what, what 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 is massacre will be reduced. Thank you. Russell or Michael? Okay, so real quick here, um, you know, we're talking about these these uh, massacres, right? I want I want to talk a little bit on 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 our uh, our, our great uh, ceremonial man. His name was Black Elk. Uh, he's Ogala, and he's, he's from the Sioux Nations of South Dakota. Uh, one of the worst massacres, I guess, happened uh, on December 29th, 1890. It wounded me. We have many of these to talk. We have so many massacres that happened to us. Say. And uh, this, this happened soon after the killing leader of uh, Sitting Bull and uh, another one of our great leaders behind me, his name is Crazy Horse. And this mountain is behind Mount Rushmore. And uh, it's a carving of him, of a, of a great leader, Crazy Horse, who fought for our freedom. He didn't want preservations. And so the army killed him. So I wanna read something to you um, from a white author you might know. All right, um, the whites, this is quote, the whites by law of conquest, by justice of civilizations are masters of the American continent. And the best safety of the frontier settlers will be secured by the total annihilation, I, I, I don't like that word, annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Okay, so the editor of the paper was L. Frank, Bomb, you all know who he is? He's the author of the wonderful book, Wizard of Oz, right? So, you know, this account of mass, of, of Wounded Knee Massacre, he was all for it. He loved what was going on. So it, we, you know, you know, moving forward, we're talking about greed. It's greed of the government, it's greed of, uh, of civil society. Many of civil society are investors into huge mining corporations, huge oil and gas corporations. And here we are as indigenous folk, we fight for the right, we fight for the number one product is water. Our women are standing up to these big governments, these big uh, pipelines. You've seen what happened at Standing Rock. Our women are standing front line for us. And as, as indigenous as men, as our warriors, we're standing there beside them. We're protecting them. Not only protecting, we're protecting our women and they're protecting our waters. Um, 
So the biggest thing that we have to uh, be afraid of is this climate change. It's big and it's real. And uh, mm -hmm. as indigenous folk, we're the stewards of this land. So, you know, again, um, you know, bring your protocol, talk to our elders, talk to our women, and uh, you know, you'll know the stories. I've got so much to share, but so little time. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> Thank you. And Bishop, I know Michael probably. Michael, you have 10 seconds and then we hand it over to Bishop. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, 10 seconds. Well, okay. so uh, I would just uh, concur with, with uh, what uh, Russell just uh, said. Uh, and this is perhaps the biggest massacre of all times is what is going on now and what will be an increasing problem in the future is the way our deeply unsustainable economic system is perpetrating massacre now and in the future in terms of the consequences of extreme exploitation and climate damage, uh, climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, and so on and so forth. And this will call for climate justice. It's already calling forth climate justice. So, uh, but uh, that said, uh, let's not also make a fetish of the idea of massacre and, and think that as long as we can just address massacres, the problems will be solved. And the call for reparations goes much deeper than that. So let us also recognize that. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the panelists uh, for your way of participating. Uh, I know my friend, the Reverend Dr. James Lawson has often said that the plantation economy is, is an e plantation of capitalism is an economy of greed and that that's an enemy that we have not yet tackled. And that economy of greed, Russell referred to it, it affects everything. It's a part of the injustices against humans, but also against the earth. And the whole challenge we have about climate justice now, that's a part of all of us, that we can be a part of Mother Earth. Thank you indeed, each and every one of you for the way in which you participated. And I would, if you'd let me, just like to close with prayer. So would you be with me now in a spirit of prayer as we prepare to close? Oh, almighty and most merciful God, we lift up our prayer to you as we have remembered massacres and as we have heard stories of resilience and as we have dreamed of a better future. We pray now to be kept away from the thing that hurts people. We pray to be kept away from the thing that hurts the earth, that hurts all of the animals and all of the creatures on this planet. We know that the early years of our Lord's life were marked by violence and massacres at the orders of the despot Herod. And so we pray for children and creatures and families living in situations in our world where violence continues and where the results are tangible. Oh, dear God, Christ is our peace. Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. And so like the resilience of those who have gone before us, we pray that we might live as children of the life and that as children of light, we might see a time when there is abundant life for all of the children and all of creation. This is our prayer. Amen. 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 Amen.
Okay, Laura, thank you.